Hello, friends. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dave, and this is the Chase the Summit Trail Talk podcast, where we talk all things fitness tech, GPS watches, wearable fitness tech. Uh, did I say that already? Uh, ultra marathon running, running in general, trail running, hiking, and just about anything else that piques my interest on a given week. Uh, this this podcast is going to be pretty feature packed. I got some notes here on my phone. Uh, so today we're going to talk about a few different things. Uh, first, I want to talk about the recent 100 mile long ultra marathon that I attempted to run. If you watch the main YouTube channel, you already know what happened, but I thought it would be fun to sort of break it down in a more long format way in this podcast, talk about what I think went right, what I think went wrong along the way at this particular race and uh, what I got out of it, what I learned. So I'll break that all down. Uh, I also want to talk about a few new devices that hit the market recently. We've got the the new Polar Vantage V3 that was announced a few days ago. Uh, and this kind of puts Polar back on the map. I'm really excited about this device. I have a test device coming very soon, uh, but I figured we can sort of go through the specs and talk about my feelings about it in this podcast today. I also want to talk about some new Garmin's that are coming to market. And these are exciting, but not in the way that you would expect. Like you're not going to go buy these probably unless you really hate money. So the Garmin Mark, uh, what do they call them? The Mark Carbon Collection just hit the market. Uh, these are very expensive watches, but they are very cool, like very unique. So we'll talk about that in this episode today. And finally, the new Sunto Race. This is a new device from Sunto, obviously, that was announced today, October 13th, at the time of filming this podcast. And it's a really interesting one that I think is going to put Sunto back on the leaderboard when it comes to uh, wearable, you know, GPS watches at like the high end level where Garmin typically kind of held the crown. Sunto is coming in hot with this new Sunto race because the price point is really impressive for what you're getting. Before we get to all of that, uh, I do want to give a couple of shout outs first for the, or to the Patreon members. If you don't know what Patreon is, it's basically a way for you, the listener or viewer to contribute a couple of bucks uh, every month. It can be as inexpensive or expensive as you want. And it's a really nice way to support the creators that you like. Maybe not me, maybe somebody else. I just think Patreon is a great way to help support the people you watch and listen to. If you want to learn more about Patreon, check out the link in the show notes down below. And I also want to give a shout out to the YouTube members of the main channel that also help keep this going, keep the lights on, keep the mic on. Uh, I really appreciate everybody who supported the podcast in the main YouTube channel for the past couple of years means a lot to me. Uh, another shout out to the Chase the Summit merch store. We still have uh, Chase the Summit trucker hats in stock. As you can see here, if you're on YouTube, you can see me holding this hat. This is the, the Ridgeline trucker hat. One of my favorites. Uh, I personally wear it every race. If you ever watch a race video of me, I'm probably wearing this hat and I've got about 50 left in stock. So check out the chase to summit.com slash shop. And you can use the exclusive discount code for podcast listeners. And that's listen, the word listen, L I S T E N two zero for 20% off your order. That's listen 20 for 20% off your entire order. On that note, if the hat is too rich for your blood, we also have the chase to summit, uh, holographic reflective stickers, which I'm a big fan of as well. There are a few bucks and I'll get them in the mail ASAP. Okay. So I think that's all the shout outs, all the plugs for now. Oh, one more thing. Uh, if you haven't yet, go check out the YouTube channel for the podcast, the Chase the Summit Trail Talk YouTube channel that's separate from the main channel. That's where you can listen to this podcast, but you can also see me. You can see what I'm doing here. And I do find YouTube to be uh, a little bit funner because you can engage there. You can comment. I can reply to the comments where audio listeners, unfortunately, I can't do that. So go check out the YouTube channel for the podcast. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. Let's get those numbers up because it would be cool to get that podcast over a thousand listeners or, or subscribers on YouTube. Uh, that'd be great. Right now we're right around like 630. So head over there, hit subscribe. That means a lot to me. And without further ado, let's get to the content of this podcast. Sorry for all the plugs, but I got to do it. You know, I got to remind you to hit that subscribe button. <laughs> uh, so the first topic is... The Mid-State Massive 100 Mile Ultra Marathon. Like I said, I've got a whole bunch of notes here on my phone. And the way I typically run races is after I finish a race or after I DNF in this case, I write down a crap load of notes. I like to just 
dump my thoughts out on my notes on my phone and just try to get as much detail as possible in these notes, like what I packed, what I think went right or wrong, what I wore, what was what was going through my mind at any given time during the race. And I find it to be valuable to sort of journal my races because I can go back in, in, you know, read what happened at a prior prior year's race to sort of learn what happened, you know, what went right or wrong. Uh, and I found it to be pretty valuable. So I don't know if you do this, but it's something that's, that's fun for me. And it's helpful for this podcast because, because I can simply kind of browse through these notes and we can sort of talk about what happened. So what is the mid state massive 100? Well, it's essentially a, uh, ultra marathon, obviously, but there are three different distances. There's a 30 mile version, there's a 50 mile version and there's a hundred mile version. And by the way, if you haven't yet, go check out the main YouTube channel where I have a whole video recap of this particular race. Uh, but it's only, you know, 15 minutes long where in this podcast, I can talk a lot longer than that. So check out the video, but also stay tuned here where we're going to break it down. So the mid state massive again, 30, 50 or hundred miles, and it follows something called the mid state trail. So the Mid-State Trail is a trail that runs down the middle of the state here in Massachusetts. Shocker. That's where they get the name Mid-State Trail. It essentially takes the state of Massachusetts and sort of, sort of uh, cuts it in half. And the trail runs from north to south, starts right on the border of New Hampshire, and it finishes right on the border of Connecticut and Rhode Island. So if you run the 100-mile version of this race, you run the entire length of that trail all the way from New Hampshire to Connecticut, which I think in my little adventure brain is super cool because essentially within a 24 hour period, you're going to step, you're going to step foot in four different States in America, which is kind of crazy. So I signed up for the hundred mile version of this race and it's not the first time I've run this race. In fact, if you look behind me here, right there, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a buckle hanging on my wall. That is a mid state massive 100 finisher buckle from 2019. Next to it is the Vermont 100 buckle right about there. Uh, but I did finish it before. So I knew I, what I was getting into. It's a hard race. Uh, and it's hard for a variety of reasons. So the course itself is a little bit tricky in the early stages of the race from mile one to about 40 or 50. The trail is actually pretty technical. There's a lot of, um, elevation gain in that period of the race. And, the overall terrain is really technical. There's a lot of rock scrambles and, um, you know, really steep climbs and descents. And, uh, it's not like, you know, I'm not roped up climbing up the side of a mountain, but the, for, for trail running, it is pretty technical in areas in that first half of the race. After that, after you get beyond mile 50, it does mellow out a little bit. It becomes a little bit easier. Uh, unfortunately I didn't get to see that part of the race. Uh, but that's, that's kind of, the whole thing here. And when it came to this particular race on October 7th, there was one big variable and that was the weather. Unfortunately, we did not get very good weather for this race. In fact, it was downright awful. I'll say that uh, pretty confidently. So right from the starting line at 9.30 a.m. all the way until two o'clock in the morning when I ended up dropping out of the race, it was raining. That entire time, and not just raining, I'm talking like torrential downpours for, for large portions of that amount of time. And if it wasn't downpouring, it was very foggy. And if it wasn't very foggy, there were uh, ankle to shin deep puddles of mud and slippery surfaces. And to top it all off, it, it was all covered in a fine layer of leaves that had fallen off the trees because it's fall here in Massachusetts. And that's what happens around here which is beautiful. The leaves are all turning colors, but it does make slippery terrain even more slippery when there's a coating of leaves on top of it. So that gives you some context about the race and sort of the impending doom that I was in for. Uh, before we get any further, I do want to give a shout out to the people who crossed the finish line at this race to give you some context on the difficulty this year. About 105 people, I think, started the race and only 43 finished. So, you know, less than half of the people ended up finishing the race and the rest dropped for whatever reason. It could have been like me, uh, where I was having somewhat of an injury, which we will talk about in a minute, but I've, I've heard from other people that they, they just got sick of the weather and, um, 
you know, it was a lot. We were all getting our butts, butts kicked out there. <laughs> so let's rewind time back to the starting line of the race. Like I said, right at the starting line, downpouring raining. Uh, my brother-in-law, shout out Adrian, gave me a ride to the starting line. He dropped me off. And right off the bat, I was cold and wet before we even started the race. So I decided I would put on my rain shell. I had a pretty thick, not a thick, but you know, one of those lightweight rain shells made by Outdoor Research. Uh, mine is the Helium 2, I think is the model, which is like a very packable rain shell. It's fully waterproof. So I decided to wear that right out of the starting line, which I did reg regret. So after we started the race, a couple of miles in, it's raining heavily, but it's also not super cold, but not super warm. And I ended up overheating like right off the bat. So I took off the rain shell, stuck it in my bag. And that was a mistake right off the bat because now my rain shell that I valued quite a bit for the remainder of the day was wet and in my bag and I was wet. So there was no point in getting my rain shell wet. I should have saved that for later on to have like a fresh, dry rain layer, but I did not do that. Anyways, for like mile one through, I don't know, mile one through 10, things went pretty smoothly passing through the first aid station. Um, no issues really. I mean, other than it being very wet and moving a lot slower than I had anticipated, I was hoping to you know, beat my previous time at this race. Selfishly, I was trying to beat the last time I ran it back, you know, that buckle there. I think I finished in 26 and a half hours for that one or 26 hours and 40 minutes. I was hoping to beat that in some way. You know, it was a lofty goal. Um, so I tried to maintain a pace that would get me ahead of that. And I was using my Garmin for that. I had uh, the Pace Pro plan set up on my Garmin. I had navigation on my Foreigner 965 for that. And that was all working well. So I'm cruising along mile one through 10. No big issues. Again, very wet. Uh, but met a lot of great people out there. Everyone's, you know, having a good time for what it was. And then we get into like mile 20 through 30. And that's where things get a lot more interesting because you head up over some more technical terrain. And um, that's about when you approach Mount Wachusett. So Mount Wachusett is the big climb. It's the highest point on the course. It's not a huge mountain. I think it's like a little under 3,000 feet tall. It's a, a ski mountain. Um, and this is where would be the first place I'd be able to access my drop bags. At this particular race, it, they have a really cool feature here that because it's a point-to-point -point race and it runs you know, in one direction, it's not a looped course, solo runners do get a drop bag. And what's cool about the drop bag is it actually moves with you. So if you want to store an extra pair of shoes or your headlamp or whatever, you can keep that in your drop bag and access it when you actually need it. Unfortunately, you can only see your drop bag three times in the hundred mile distance. Uh, and the first time you see it is at eight station four, which is at Mount what you sit the big climb, like I just talked about. So when I got to Mount what you sit, um, I refueled, refilled my water, and then I kind of scrambled to figure out what I want to bring with me for, you know, the next 20 or so miles before getting to the next time I'd see my drop bag. I uh, got all my gear, ate some potatoes. If I recall correctly, I had a pickle, <laughs> some random food. That was sort of my dinner for the day. And then I started the climb up Mount Wachusett. This is, you know, it's kind of a butt kicker and it gets pretty technical near the top of Mount Wachusett. And I would say by the time I hit the top, the summit of Mount Wachusett, that is when the weather and the conditions became really uncomfortable. At the top of the mountain, this super dense fog sort of set in, like to the point where I couldn't see the runner, you know, 10 feet in front of me. It was very foggy and there was this heavy mist. It, was, it wasn't really like raining, but it was so, the, there was so much moisture in the air that it was just coating everything including the extremely slick technical trail on the descent. So I was in a group about, you know, of about like 15 runners and we're all trying to go downhill down the backside of Mount Wachusett. And I wanted to get more footage of this with my GoPro for my video. But to be honest, it was so treacherous going down the backside that I couldn't even take my GoPro out because I needed both hands free to be able to brace myself off of various, th various things like trees and, uh, you know, crawling on rocks and stuff because it was like downright scary going down the backside of Mount Wachusett. And because I was in this big group of people going down the backside, 
I was like holding my breath because I was worried that somebody was going to trip and you know, whoever was around that person would be responsible to help them get out of there because it was so slippery and dark and foggy. And, uh, I tell you, by the time we got to the bottom of that, that descent, a bunch of us kind of like high fived and kind of yelled into the night because of, you know, just the relief of knowing we were over that point of the course. So after that, uh, that's when the darkness set in, my headlamp went on. And if you watch the video on the main channel, basically you didn't see me for the rest of the video because all you'd see would be my headlamp. GoPros are notoriously not very good in the dark. In the dark, that's when things became very difficult for me personally um, because it continued to rain. At points, it was like heavily downpouring. I was texting my wife uh, asking for like weather updates, asking when she could tell when the rain would stop because it was becoming unbearable at that point. And it got very cold. That was a another struggle we faced. It, it, you know, everything's wet. And to give you a little context on how wet things got, I had my vest filled with Ziploc bags and dry bags that are used for like canoeing, basically like kayaking. So these dry bags, they have like a roll top and they kind of clip together to keep your contents dry and safe and everything wetted through. I had, I had, um, Ziploc bags of electrolyte mix, like powder, the water got in there and turned it into like jelly. I had Ziploc bag bags with, um, gloves and in spare layers that all got wet. I had Ziploc bags with my, my phone, my headlamp, some spare battery banks that all got wet. Nothing wasn't wet at this point. So when I got cold for, you know, to give you an idea of what I was wearing, I had a t-shirt on, uh, you know, a, a dry tech, you know, quick drying type t-shirt. I had shorts on, I had a uh, NG NG toe socks, my ultra Mont Blanc boa shoes, and I was wearing my outdoor research rain shell over the top. And of course I had the Chase Summit trucker hat. Shout out Chase Summit trucker hat. But to be, to be honest, the wearing a hat in these kinds of conditions is great because the water doesn't hit you on the face. It, you can kind of keep the rim low and it kind of beads off the front of the hat, protects your face a little bit. It's a nice little uh, piece of comfort in the rain. So anyways, I, I was very cold. I tried swapping my layers around, but like I said, every, everything was wet. So the only thing that I could do is sort of just embrace the suck basically and keep moving. You know, as long as you're moving, you're kind of getting your heart rate up, you can stay warm. And when you come to a stop, it got very cold. There were a couple of points that were really nice. Like I think it was eight station five or six had like warm broth. They had like a bowl, like a, a, a propane stove and they were heating up broth and that really hit the spot that like warmed up my whole core and was really nice to have. Um, shout out to the volunteers, by the way, they, they did a great job and they they had to stand out in the rain the whole night as well. Okay. So let's get, I'm, I'm kind of getting off track here. Let's, so I was cold. Um, in let's just get to the point where things start, started to go downhill. Two major issues. So right about mile 30, remember when I was talking about that descent down Mount which you said that was kind of scary and slippery. I rolled my ankle at that point of the race, but it felt like it was like a minor roll, you know, like sometimes you step off something and it's just like, you're like, oh, that hurt a little bit, but at least you're not in pain, like continued pain. But that roll, um, 20 miles later started to turn into something more serious where my Achilles tendon on the back of my, my heel on the back of my right foot started to hurt quite a bit. And it really hurt when I like flexed my toes, kind of pointed my toes like a bar ballerina, I guess, or flexed them up towards my shin. This sort of up and down movement is what really triggered that pain. Uh, and that's when I became very concerned. I was 50 miles into a race and the idea of running another 50 miles on an ankle that felt like that wasn't very appealing to me. The other issue I ran into that was equally as uncomfortable, if not more uncomfortable, was chafe. And I know chafe is such a fun topic to talk about. Uh, it's kind of disgusting, but <laughs> the reality of the situation was that we everybody everybody out there was very uncomfortable in chafing in some way. Um, my personal situation was in my armpits and even on my shoulders where my vest was sitting. And of course, all the other bits down below that you can imagine. Um, I had some serious problems between my thighs, like on my legs. That's really where it was hurting the most. And actually after the fact, when I 
got home and was able to take a shower. I was bleeding there. It got that bad. So very uncomfortable. Um, and to mitigate it, I had, I had body glide in the back of my pack for like an emergency. If I ran into like a hot spot on my foot or something, I ended up taking it out of my pack and keeping it in my hand. And literally like every 10 minutes while running, I just apply it everywhere, trying to mitigate and reduce the friction of what was happening because the chafe was really, really uncomfortable. So I got to the halfway point. Well, let's rewind. I, I got to eight station six, the eight station before the halfway point. And like I said, this race is three distances. So eight station seven is the halfway point at the 50 mile mark, which turns out to be more like 51 or 52 miles. And that's where the, the 50 mile race starts, but it's also one of the bigger eight stations for the hundred mile runners. And that's where I had my drop bag again, where I could go and access it one more time. So in my head, at H station six, I'm like, listen, man, pull it together. All you got to do is make it to H station seven. And from there, you can clean yourself up, get some dry clothes because the rain was starting to kind of reduce, kind, kind of pump its brakes a little bit. And then, you know, start fresh with dry clothes and hopefully mitigate some of the chafing issues. Maybe get an ace bandage on my ankle and piece myself back together for the next 50 miles. But this is the point in the race where I realized for the first time in my entire, you know, ultra running career that I was chasing cutoffs. If you don't know what a cutoff is, it's basically the point where the eight station crew will tell you, you can, you can't continue because you're moving too slow. Um, and I've never had that situation before and and I was in the situation now. So at eight station six, the eight station people there told me that I had about two hours to get from six to seven. In the gap between H station six and seven is about six, six and a half miles, but it was all on trails in the dark and in my situation with a sore ankle and chafing like crazy, I was not moving very fast. So two hours to cover six, over six miles in my current state would be a struggle. Um, but I told myself, I'm just going to keep moving until they basically tell me I can't. From there, I just started trucking. I was basically power hiking at this point. I was running with a group of people that was, they were really trying to motivate me to keep moving. They were like, come on, you can stay with us and we're all going to move together. And I appreciate that. Uh, but I couldn't hang with them. They were all moving a lot quicker than me. And that was mainly due to my ankle. I was worried. Um, I didn't, I, you know, have a permanent injury after this race. I didn't want that. I didn't want to come home and not be able to run for, you know, six months because I decided to push through something at a race. So I just took my time. And by the time I showed up at eight station seven, the halfway point, I had missed the cutoff time. So the cutoff time was 1.15 a.m. in the morning. And I showed up at the aid station at 1.19. I was four minutes late. Four minutes late to the halfway aid station. However, the aid station person there, the aid station captain, um, basically said, you're past cutoffs, but if you want, you can, you can we'll let you go. But you got to be quick. You got to be in and out of this aid station. And I knew in my mind, it, the best thing to do would be to drop here because a, I wouldn't be able to be quick. I don't think, you know, my idea when I got there was basically to strip down, get some of the wipes. I had like baby wipes in my bag, basically give myself like a makeshift shower, reapply lube everywhere, put dry clothes on, address the issues with my feet, maybe new socks, body glide on my feet, maybe tape up my ankle, put my shoes back on and be out. And all of that would have taken me like five to 10 minutes along with refueling, getting more food in, um, filling up my water bottles, all of that. And I knew ultimately that my ankle hurt enough where the rest of the race was going to be a wash. Anyways, I could have maybe spent the entire night like chasing cutoffs and in power hiking the entire thing. But like, did I really want to do that? Not really. So at that point, that's when I, had, I decided to drop from the race. So my watch said 54 miles and change, and that's because I got lost a few times. And all of that took 16 hours, 15 hours and 55 minutes to get there. I was wearing two watches. I had the Apple Watch Ultra 2 on one wrist and the Garmin 400 965 on the other. And they both agreed with the duration of time and distance. And that was that. I was dropped. Now that's where the adventure began though, because I dropped out of the race at almost two o'clock in the morning. And, um, my only way home was my brother-in-law basically. So I couldn't call my wife because she was home 
sleeping, we have four kids. She wouldn't be able to just get up and leave and go pick me up or wake everybody up on my account to go pick me up. Um, and then my brother-in-law offered to help in the event of something happening like this, but I didn't want to call him in the middle of the night. I felt really guilty about that. So I tried to figure out other ways of getting home from this point. And just for context, I live like an hour and a half from where I dropped, you know, a drive, an hour and a half drive. So I, I can't just like Uber home because I'm like in the middle of nowhere, really in Rutland, Massachusetts at, at like a boat dock in the middle of the night. And I tried Uber, but that didn't work out so well. Thankfully, there was a family there that was waiting for their runner. Basically, this guy's crew. Um, the, the runner's name was Chris. I think the mom was Lauren, Sharon. And then there was a daughter. Her name was Lily. So shout out if they're, by chance you listen to this or watch this podcast. They overheard my situation. I was basically explaining to somebody how like I was trying to figure out a way to get home because the aid station was breaking down they're like they're pulling their tents down and they're packing up to go to the next, the next aid station. So I wouldn't be able to just stay there. Everybody was leaving. So the aid station crew said, Hey man, like you can come with us. You can get in this minivan and drive to the next aid station. And from there you can try to figure it out or you can try to get home from, from here. Um, and basically this guy's family, he was dropping as well. He didn't make the cutoff time. They overheard my situation and she, she offered to give me a ride to get me closer to home. And so we agreed. I got in their car. They drove me to a town called Lem Lemonster where I went to like a, I just Googled a, a major hotel. There it was like a Hilton. And from there I was able to get an Uber ride home. I didn't walk in my door at home until 3.30 AM. And I had been awake for, you know, since five o'clock AM the previous day. So I was very tired. I shocked my wife. She shut up out of the bed. She's like, what are you doing here? I had to explain the whole situation. I took a shower and then I promptly went to bed for like four hours until my kids woke up the next day and uh, up and at them back into dad mode the following day. So the following day, uh, I know this is getting a little drawn out, but I just want to like wrap this all up. I woke up and I wanted to feel, you know, figure out what was going on with my body at that point. The chafing was still really bad, but you know, thankfully the shower, being able to put some bandages on things helped quite a bit. And I was worried about my ankle. Um, but to be honest, like my ankle felt a lot better just the next day. So I don't know what was going out on when I was actually running or how serious this injury was when I was out there, but it seemed to sort of fade off overnight, which uh, I was thankful for, but also honestly, like kind of frustrated by it because it felt serious when I was running. And like I said, I mainly dropped because of that. Um, but then I ended up feeling not so serious the next day. And now, you know, it's been what, five days since the race and my ankle feels fine. In fact, today I'm probably going to run. Um, and you know, I think I'm okay. So I'm thankful, but I'm also a little frustrated. And that brings me to sort of my takeaway from this race. And it's like, so what could have, what could I have done better? Um, and I think the major thing, the major takeaway for me is like, I need to train in the rain and in the dark more because the issues I ran into with the chafing and stuff, I think I would have figured out a way to mitigate that better if I had trained in the rain more often, but I'm kind of a fair weather runner. It's not something I enjoy doing. So if it's raining out, I typically hit my treadmill. Um, but now I think I need to kind of push myself a little bit more in terms of being uncomfortable to learn more about my performance and, and you know, what I could do better. And I think the other thing I struggle with is injury, right? So the ankle situation felt very serious in the moment, but like, how do you tell what's serious and when is it the right point to pull the plug on a race? There's two ways to look at this, right? Like, I guess if I wanted it enough, I would have just like stuck it out and kept moving and then risked hurting myself seriously for the long term just to get that buckle. But I guess I didn't want it you know, that bad because I wasn't willing to do that in the moment. It hurt enough where I was like, I should probably drop because I want to be able to have, you know, some legs after this. I want to be able to run after this race. And I guess that, I guess that's kind of where things ended for me. If I had pushed harder or like just left more out there, I probably could have finished the race. And it kind of sucks knowing that now, you know, but we're like, I just don't get it. I like, I, I wish, 
I wish there was a way to know what's serious and what's not. Like there's no real way to know. And I guess the only way to learn that is to like keep pushing your limits and training until you can figure that out. Does that make sense? Anyways, that's my takeaway. That's my story about the Mid-State Massive 100. Didn't end as I wanted. Um, and now I'm left wondering if I should go back next year. It's a race that's local to me. It's pretty close to home. And it's so unique for this area to have a point-to-point -point 100 miler. And to be honest, the race is awesome. The organization behind it is really good. They've really dialed in the process and everything's gotten a lot funner um, since the first year. Like they're, the first year of this race was in 2019 and now in 2023, they've, they've really dialed it in. So we'll see. I might go back next year. Well, time will tell. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I'm still still a little, uh, still get a little bit, a bit of the PTSD from this year's race. So that's the race in a nutshell. Uh, I'll stop talking about it there. Let's move on. The next topic is we're going to jump into the fitness tech news this week. Like I said, there are three devices I want to talk about in particular. We'll, we'll start with the Polar Vantage V3. So this is a device I'm very excited about because Polar is a, a brand I've liked quite a bit. I've enjoyed the brand, but like over the past two years or so, They've become very quiet and really haven't changed. They haven't like released a game changing or innovative product in a long time. So to see the Polar Vantage V3 come out with a lot of updates that they really need to do is a big deal. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll give you it in a nutshell. Basically, it's uh, a, a Polar Vantage series watch, obviously, by the name. And if you know that series, you know what they look like. It has a very similar, very familiar look to the Polar Vantage V2 which is nice for people who like that look. It's got a similar button layout. It's got the five button layout, but this year it now gets a 1.39 inch AMOLED touch enabled display, which is a huge upgrade for Polar because in the past they've used those transflective or MIP displays that are sort of dull in Polar in particular, their MIP displays were some of the dimmest and hardest to read. So to see an, an AMOLED display on a Polar product at a high level is really nice. This watch is gonna come in at $599 here in the USA. And you can also get it in a bundle for 650 bucks and they'll include their Polar H10 ECG strap, which is a, one of my favorites in terms of ECG straps, like a chest strap. So the price point is competitive with something like the Garmin 4965, which is in the same price category. And they've updated the heart rate sensor to do a whole bunch of new things. They're calling it Elixir, right? That's the name of it? Yeah, Polar Elixir Platform. Uh, now, the Elixir Platform isn't just the heart rate sensor. It's sort of all the things that tie into the heart rate sensor. That is an ECG sensor now built into the watch, a skin temperature sensor on the back of the watch, and an updated optical heart rate sensor. So they can use the ECG sensor on the watch now, to do something like the orthostatic test, which is a test that used to be on polar watches that you, you would need an external sensor to access. Now you can do it without an external sensor because of that ECG built in, which is really cool. And the skin temperature sensor will make contact with your wrist and every night while you're sleeping, it'll detect your skin temperature and that'll be able to roll into your recovery. So they'll be able to do some really interesting things with all of these new sensors. And then the actual optical heart rate sensor apparently got a boost in accuracy. I've always found Polar products to be pretty accurate, but now they're saying it's about 25% more accurate, which is great. And on top of that, this is the first Polar watch to have an SpO2 sensor or a blood oxygen saturation sensor. Every previous Polar watch just had an optical heart rate sensor. This year, they've tied in the SpO2 sensor as well. And I think one of the most exciting improvements about this watch is that there's a new CPU inside that's apparently 129% faster, which is an interesting number to choose. Um, but this was a major complaint for me with previous Polar watches. Basically, like even the Polar Vantage V2 or the Grid X Pro, uh, some of their newer watches always felt kind of laggy um, because their processor was not very powerful. And it just made it feel a lot more dated. And so now they've updated the processor, which is great, which means we can expect a better user experience. So they, they do have 32 gigabytes of internal storage, which can be used for the mapping, which I haven't mentioned yet. Let's talk about that now. So this watch is compatible with full-blown offline mapping. Again, the, 
the first Polar Watch to have real mapping built in. That's awesome. This is something I've been waiting for for a long time. And you can download the maps for free from Polar's website right to the watch over Wi-Fi. Uh, super cool. Actually, it's not over Wi-Fi. I believe it's over USB. So that's kind of interesting. And the maps do look to be really good. So if you're aware of Garmin maps, like Garmin is the class leader when it comes to mapping and navigation because they have labels on their maps for trails. You'll see a little you know, text that tells you what the trail is, what the road is, what a waterway is, and there's points of interest. So a summit of a mountain or a water source or a restaurant or whatever, you'll see that on the map on a Garmin. Now, if you go to the other side of things, like a Coros watch, on Coros watches on their maps, there's no data. All you see is the map. So you'll see a, the, the trail as a dotted line or a road or a waterway as a blue area, but those things don't have labels. So you don't know what, what trail or road you're actually on. You just know you're on a trail or a road. The polar maps look like kind of a hybrid of Garmin and Coros, where they do show labels for certain things like like bodies of water. And it looks like trails and roads might get labels too. But the difference is they're not routable maps. So like on Garmin, you can actually create a route on the watch and follow the map where on this polar product, you won't be able to do that. It's simply context to let you know it's around you when you're out in the field, which is still really valuable. And I'm really happy they did this. It would be, but it would be really cool to see routable maps on a polar watch. Still, First Polar Watch to get full-blown mapping and navigation. I'm excited about that. I'm also excited for what that means in the future with something like a Grid X2 or Grid X Pro 2. You know, of course, they're going to keep this moving to the next product. That's very exciting. And the other thing this gets is really impressive battery life. You're looking at like 50 hours in a GPS activity and I think five or six days in standby mode, uh, which is good enough for an AMOLED watch like this. So back to my point. What's missing? So like I said, there's mapping and navigation. And because of that, there's internal storage on the watch of 32 gigabytes, which is actually a lot of space. But 32 gigabytes is quite a bit of storage. Unfortunately, you can't use that storage for music, which I thought was an odd choice. Even like Chorus does that with basic MP3s. Now, M you could argue like the value of just basic MP3s is not very good. So maybe that's why they didn't decide to do that. So there's no music storage. There's also no like, contactless payments or, you know, basic app store like Garmin. Um, they didn't update any of that. And basically the user interface is very similar to previous Polar models, but still I do think this is an exciting release from them and it moves the needle in the right direction for them. So very exciting news from Polar with the Polar Vantage V3. I'm waiting for mine to come in the mail. I haven't received it yet, but uh, stay tuned for a full review on the main channel. The next product I want to talk about or series of products is the new Garmin Mark collection. If you don't know what the Mark series is, it's basically Garmin's like answer to a luxury watch. Think Rolex or, you know, Omega, whatever. This is where Garmin tries to head with their Mark series. And this year they've released the most expensive watches that they have ever released ever. This is crazy. So this year is the Garmin Mark Carbon Collection. There's three models available and they range in price from, get this, $2,950 to $3,200, $3,200 US dollars. You heard me right, folks. A $3,200 Garmin is now available. Now, why would you spend that kind of money for a Garmin watch? Well, these are very unique. First of all, they're the top tier, like the best thing you can buy from Garmin. So because of that, they warrant some big price tag. And it really boils down to the materials they're using. They've created the new carbon collection out of carbon fiber. So the actual case of the watch, the bezel, the back plate, the sidewalls, everything is made out of a fused carbon material. And what that means is they basically layer hundreds of layers of carbon fiber. They sort of form it into a block. And then from there, they fuse it together and then they machine it after the fact. And this process is incredibly expensive and time consuming to do. And this results in a really unique looking watch. So you can actually see the layers of carbon. It looks really cool. I really want to see one in person. Uh, I don't have one, unfortunately, but the, the look of it is very unique for a Garmin watch. It looks very premium and 
in uh, it's really impressive looking. And on top of that, uh, it's also lighter. So it's about 10 grams lighter than the titanium version of a Garmin Epix or Phoenix. Now, other than that, that's kind of like the whole story. These watches are basically really premium versions of a Garmin Epix Pro 47 millimeter watch. The Epix Pro 47 is like 900 bucks. These new watches are 3000 bucks. And really what you're paying for is that super high end material in being exclusive, you know, getting a really fancy Garmin watch. They also come with really interesting bands. Like the golf version of, of this watch comes with a layered leather and silicon band. It's both materials kind of combined together to be the best of both worlds. And I sh should probably mention the models. There's three different models uh, of the carbon collection. There's the Commander, which is basically a tactical version, and you get features like the uh, Jump Master, the Stealth Mode, uh, the aviation stuff for flying planes. That's all built into the Commander series. There's the Ath the was it the Athlete? I think it's the Mark Athlete Carbon, which is the cheapest one. That's twenty nine fifty, and that's basically just a Epix Pro forty seven in carbon. <laughs> for a lot more money. And then there's the Mark Carbon Golfer Edition, which has all the golf stuff built into it. And that one comes with that really cool leather in, in um, silicone band. And that's the, I think that one comes in at $3,100. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I'd love to get your feel for what these watches are all about. Let me know in the comments down below if you're, if you'd want one of these or if it, they're just like grossly grossly overpriced. I know they are, obviously. They are what they are. There are a couple of interesting things about these, though. Even though they're like pretty much a clone of the Epix, they do have a unique charging port. So there's like four-prong magnetic charger on the back of the watch that's different than any other Garmin. I don't know why they did that, but it looks kind of cool. And the other thing that's kind of interesting about these watches, I sat through like a media briefing about them, is that they're the only Garmin watch that I know of that actually has a service option. So somebody asked in the Q&A at the media briefing if Garmin would support servicing of these watches, and they said that they replace a broken display, like a cracked sapphire lens. They would refinish the body. If you scratch the carbon fiber, they would replace the battery or refurbish it if the battery became, uh, you know, deprecated or, or started to lose its charge over time, they'll do all of that. And that's because these watches are so expensive. And the Mark series does come with a two year warranty rather than a standard Epix that comes with just a one year warranty. And I actually found that to be a kind of interesting. Is it worth another $2,000 to get that? Probably not, but it is nice to know that they back you up if you spend that kind of money. I'm gonna try to get my hands on one to do like an unboxing on the main channel. I don't know if it'll happen, but stay tuned for that. And uh, the final the final product I want to talk about in this podcast is the new, well, two more products, is the new Sunto products, one being the new watch they came out with called the Sunto Race, and the other being a pair of headphones that Sunto came out with, which I was not expecting, but they're kind of cool. So let's start with the watch. Out of everything I talked about in this podcast, the Sunto Race, the new Sunto Race watch is probably uh, what I think is the most exciting and it's mainly because of the price. So this watch comes in, there's two different versions. There's a stainless steel version and a titanium version. Stainless steel comes in at $449. The titanium version is hundred bucks more for $549. Those are expensive, yes, but this is a watch that's built like a tank. If you know what the Sunto Vertical is, um, it's basically like a, a Garmin Phoenix or Epix alternative. Great battery life, really good build quality, designed in Finland by Sunto. The Sunto Race is basically exactly the same watch as a vertical for less money and with an AMOLED display, which has me very confused. So the Sunto Race basically takes every feature from the Sunto Vertical that includes mapping and navigation. It's got all the same training tools and actually gets additional training tools and wellness features like HRV tracking for much less money. For context, 
The Sunta Vertical came in at $629 for the cheaper model and $839 for the most expensive titanium model. So the titanium version of the race is $300 cheaper than the Sunto Vertical. And I'm just so confused by that. So the Sunto race comes with a huge AMOLED display, 1.43 inches. It's got dual frequency, multi-band GPS, kind of the gold standard. It's got the same heart rate sensor as the Sunto Vertical. It's got offline mapping and navigation with a base map built in. And all for $449. Now, for, for some comparisons here, the Garmin Foreigner 965 I have here, I love this watch, but this watch comes in at $599. So it's significantly more expensive than the Sunto Race, while the Sunto Race gets a sapphire display, a bigger AMOLED display, better build quality because it's made out of stainless steel or titanium, and this is mainly plastic, and it's way less money. And this is... Uh, this is a, a really smart move from Sunto, but I'm still confused by it. So I think Sunto is doing this because if, you, if you've if you been paying attention to the market for the past few years, I think they're sort of bleeding out. They're kind of running out of customers because they used to be one of the the most prestigious brands in like the sport of ultra marathon running, in, in orienteering and hiking, and brands like Koros have really grown significantly and gained a big part of the market share. Garmin continues to grow and brands like Polar and Sunto have sort of been falling behind a little bit, in my opinion. This, I think, is going to put Sunto back on the map. And even more so than that Polar watch we just talked about with the Vantage V3, putting Polar back on the map. Because if you compare the two, the, the Polar Vantage V3 is $599. The Sunto Race is four is five forty nine for the more expensive titanium model, and it has more features than the Polar Vantage V three. I mean, in some cases, so the Vantage V three has that new optical heart rate sensor that has the skin temperature and and the ECG that's not on the race. But when it comes to other stuff, I think the Sunto Race has more features when it comes to like recovery tools um, and designing courses in the app and syncing it to the maps and things like that. I mean, I'll have to do a comparison down the road when I fi finally get them in my hands. But so what we're working with here is a 1.43 inch touch enabled AMOLED display that's got a thousand nits of brightness. Another big change on the Sunto race is that it's got a three button layout. It's got a top button, a bottom button and a digital crown, which reminds me a lot of something like a Coros, uh, Coros Vertex watch with the three buttons and the digital crown. And that digital crown will allow you to navigate the menu a lot more easier. A lot, and it will also allow you to zoom in and out in mapping. And it's got great battery life. We're looking at uh, between 50 to 120 hours in a GPS activity and between six and 12 days of standby mode, all for 449 or 549. I like this. I think this is going to make things really interesting this year as it comes to market. Uh, one thing that is kind of interesting with this Sunto race is that Sunto as a brand has really uh, prided themselves in being a Finnish brand and developing all of their hardware in Finland. So the previous Sunto Vertical, I believe, was built in Finland. Now, the Sunto Race is, is made in China. And I, I don't know if that's how they saved money when it comes to the price point. I, it could be. Maybe that's what they had to do. And, you know, that's fine. Everybody else is making stuff in China. I just don't know how that works. It's just really interesting because I think with the announcement of the Sunto race, like who's going out and spending more money for the Sunto vertical with a duller display? Typically, like with Garmin, like the Garmin Phoenix 7 and Epix basically have the same feature set. And the only difference between the two is going to be their displays, while the Epix is always a little bit more money, right? Like the Epix Pro is a little bit more than the Phoenix 7 Pro, I think, in most cases. Now here, it's the opposite. On the Sunto platform or the Sunto ecosystem, we're looking at the Sunto vertical being like significantly more money than the Sunto race. I think they're cannibalizing their sales of the vertical. And I don't, I don't know how else to say that unless they really discount the Sunto vertical very soon and maybe it goes on sale forever for like 200 bucks off. That would probably make sense. The only other advantage you get with the Sunto vertical is going to be significantly longer battery life in standby mode because that has an MIP display 
it'll go for over a month on a single charge where the Sunto race will only last for seven to 12 days, six to 12 days, something like that. So that is the Sunto race. I was going to say vertical. <laughs> and the last product we'll talk about in this podcast is going to be the new headphones from Sunto. Did not see this coming at all. These are called the Sunto Wing Headphones. These are open ear design headphones, which are kind of all the rave right now. I feel like every brand from Bose to Sony to whoever else, they're all coming out with these open ear design, which are basically like little speakers that kind of hook over your ears and they project sound downward into your ear canal while leaving your ears open so you can hear what's going on around you. This is kind of the new movement. Uh, you know, bone conduction headphones were very popular for a while with like the brands like Aftershocks where you could hear what's going on because you have the bone conduction headphones on your skull and everything else would be going through your ears. In this case, these are like micro speakers that sort of blast music down into your ears, um, which I think sound better in most cases than bone conduction. And now Sunto is entering the game. The Sunto Wing headphones have a couple of unique features. First of all, they claim to be showerproof or waterproof, and they are focusing on durability. So the Sunto headphones are supposed to be really bomb-proof, waterproof. You can take a shower with them without worrying about them, um, which will be good for trail runners and hikers out there that want to throw these in their pack and not worry about them. They also come with a really interesting like charging cradle. They sort of sit on this big cradle. And the final interesting feature about these is that they have red flashing lights around the, the backside of the, the headphones in order to be more visible when you're running out there when you're on trails or roads, people to be able, be able to see you because you have a red flashing light on your headphones. I think that's actually a really smart move, and I'd like to see other brands do that. The only thing I hope for this is that you can turn that off because if I'm like listening to music at my desk, I don't want strobing lights coming off my head. But that might just be me. Um, I don't have any of these products yet. Like I said, they're all in the mail. And with that, I'm starting to lose my voice here. We've been recording for 54 minutes and I think we've reached the end of this podcast. Just wanted to cover a few things. My race, the new products this week. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, I've recorded a video today, so I've already been talking a lot today. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. And if you did, please consider giving me a subscribe over on YouTube. Make sure to Hit the five-star rating on your favorite podcasting app, whether that be Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, anything like that. Make sure to give me a rating. And if you can, leave a comment like on Apple Podcasts. You can actually type a comment in and say, tell people what you like about the podcast. That really helps out the algorithm and helps people find the podcast. And I really appreciate that. One more shout out for the merch store. If you want, check out the merch store at chasesummit.com slash shop. Use discount code LISTEN20 at checkout for 20% off your order or a hat of a hat or a sticker. And that's really it, folks. I'm going to try to keep this podcast moving and I'll try to upload again next week. We'll see how, see how that plays out depending how busy I am. I, I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope you're having a good week. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. Okay, bye. Bye.